So last week I told everybody, if you weren't here, you may have missed it. Um, I, we did a survey, actually Travis did a survey for us about six months ago, and one of the parents in the school said, I don't go to church anymore because I hear I'm supposed to have a closer relationship with God, but practically I don't know how to do that, and they don't give me anything practical. So that made me really think for a long time and try to say, all right, how do I bring this to practical things and not be too churchy, <laughs> right? We're in church, I'm supposed to be the preacher and all this, but sometimes we can use language that doesn't help, or we can use methods that don't help everybody. We can be back in ancient times, kind of. So that, this is the second lesson for that. And we are going to go to Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11, and this is the New English Translation. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But he answered, It is written, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city had him stand on the highest point of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and with their hands they will lift you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, once again, it is written, you are not to put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their grandeur. And he said to him, I will give you all, of, all these things if you throw yourself to the ground and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Go away, Satan, for it is written, You are to worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and angels came and began ministering to his needs. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. God. Now, the Judean wilderness, or also called the Judean desert, is a geographical feature extending from the mountains of Judea to, in the west to the Dead Sea in the east. It's a relatively small desert, about 600 square miles, characterized by breathtaking panoramas, mountains, cliffs, chalk hills, plateaus interrupted by riverbeds and canyons. And I wanted you to see some of this today before we start out. So you can kind of see where we think Jesus went in his fasting and prayer. It's sparsely populated, has a few settlements around edges, but it's more known for rugged and desolate landscape, which has provided a refuge for rebels and zealots, monks and hermits. If you want to be a hermit, that's a good place to go, I guess. <laughs> this is where Jesus went. Now, last week when we started out talking about the tradition, uh, Christian traditions of how to connect with God, we concentrated on practical ways in growing our relationship with God through the contemplative tradition. It talks to us about prayer. And I suggested that we simply start talking with God each day like you might talk with a close friend. This daily effort, coming to God and saying, I choose to spend time with you, God, is important. We also learned that sometimes this will mean we talk less and listen more. I know I have to. <laughs> and sometimes we'll just sit and wait and see what God shows us because there are messages and what we can see and hear around us all the time too. This is habit number one, shall we say, talking to God in a new daily way. This week, I'd like to go on to the second ancient tradition, which is called the holiness tradition. It's a tradition steeped in the rules and commandments of the Old Testament, but added to in the New Testament because of how Jesus taught us and explained what God was really intending or seeking out in the rules. Let's say they're in Leviticus or Deuteronomy. You see, it was Jesus who showed us that God definitely cares about sin and whether we're living our lives according to the mandates or commandments, Yet Jesus taught us over and over again that we are to live into the word of God by following these commandments in the spirit of interpretation and their intentions. Jesus showed us that we shouldn't have to worry too much about obeying the laws in a ritualistic or strict way of viewing them, 
but that we're to read the Bible and live into the spirit and commandments given. The intent behind the rules God gives us in the Bible are to be followed as best we understand them and with a heart of good intention and sincerity. Think about this. One of the examples that Jesus gave was that he fed people from the fields, the extra wheat that was still in the fields, his own people as well as others that didn't have food, and yet it was on a Sabbath, and that was against the law, working on the Sabbath. Just doing any law without reasoning or logic is a ritualistic following. Key, lead, key factor here that the religious leaders of that time had to learn as well as we have to sometimes learn, because we can do it too. But I'm going to talk about that more when we get to the practicalities of getting closer to God with that. But to understand why God would even have laws or commandments for us, as well as how to help lead us to somehow have a closer relationship with God, it's important for us to live into the spirit of the laws, a correct, holy, that's why it's called the holiness tradition, Jesus way of living, you might say. Now, if I summarize the holiness tradition, because truthfully, I went to about six books, and there's about, I don't know, there's a lot of stuff out there, because it's one of the oldest traditions in trying to bring you closer to God and having a spiritual life, but the holiness tradition can be seen in different ways, depending on which church you went through at what time period, too. But if I was to summarize it, I would say it's a tradition of following God's wishes because the commandments lead to a happier and more functional life than if we didn't. Does that make sense? You may think you'd be happier if you went outside your marriage with someone else and it was a happy time, but that leads to things that are much more unhappy, unholy, and not with God. Do you see what I'm saying? The happier life is staying within the commandments. Yet they are for us to discern and talk to God about. And that's the key today, talking to God, aiding us and growing in our relationship with God. The growing part is when we come to God and we're asking for discernment. The growing part is having that even closer relationship or establishing the conversation with God. God gives us guidelines for life so that we do not sin and become further from God. That's the definition of sin, doing things that are, make us further from God. But we can also go, grow with God in a holy and good relationship. God can be your best friend. <laughs> Truthfully, I had to step back even after I preached myself last week and said, have I ever, if somebody said to me, who's your best friend, said God? I don't think so. When I sit back and I think about it, I think God's my best friend, but I don't think I've ever answered that question that way. And so I had to think about it, and what does that say that I should be doing in my life more? Today's scripture places Jesus after he's been baptized and after we've heard the voice say, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased, going and being tempted. But if you notice the first sentence in the uh, sentence taking him to the mountains and the desert, it says that the spirit took him there to be tempted or tested. It depends on which translation you have. God knows that we will be tested just like Jesus and that we have to have a close enough relationship with him, a close enough relation that we, ship that we listen to him to pass the test. The holiness tradition, like the contemplative tradition, has Jesus as our model because Jesus readies himself to be with God, doing God's work, and at the same time must remain true to God and God's ways by overcoming the temptations brought to him. Temptations that we have in life too. Why how? By staying holy and head and head and heart and heart with God. Practically speaking, how we become closer to God moves on from just taking time to talk with God and listening daily to stepping into the application of God's child or friend by overcoming temptations ourselves. Why? Because we've moved closer to God. Does that make sense? So the second practical step that I think of when we're having a closer relationship with God is to not only have conversations with God, 
but to listen for the advice from God because it's the best advice we'll ever get in our lives. <laughs> Practicing denying anything that we may interpret as going against the spirit of God and what God requests of us. Denying anything that makes space between us and God. Now, while the ancient holiness tradition would say that sin is anything that takes us from God, when we look at his commandments, practically speaking, I would tell you I think that it's just as important to look at the commandments and the spirit behind why God would have declared these commandments or rules so that you can talk to God about it. Who else should you talk to about it? <laughs> Lots of times we just come to the pastor or a teacher of theology or something else. I'm not saying that's wrong. It's a starting point. But if we're going to try to grow a closer relationship with God, why not go to the source? Have conversations. Take time to think and discern. Know why and what the rules of God stand for, and then why they may or may not apply through, the same, uh, through all ages, such that you may grow with your relationship and journey with God. The key to living into a happy Christian life is that you're journeying with God. Now, I love my husband, and April will be married 30 years, and we've journeyed through a lot of things. He has seen me through more than I could ever say. And most of the time when people ask me who's my best friend, it's Doug. But you know what? I know in my heart I'm not supposed to have that long journey with him as compared with God. Amen? At first, this may sound easy, too. <laughs> but if you thought about last week and even having a conversation with God and trying to listen, trying to take more time, each day adding maybe 30 seconds, which if you're sitting there in silence is a long time for Americans, is it not? <laughs> maybe if we were in Nepal or something where you would brought up in a culture that took time like this, we'd be all right. But Americans are not very good, including me, of sitting still for a while. We get anxious in that spot. So take time. It's not easy. Work through your daily praying and time to listen and discern. But remember, even when you're trying to listen and talk with God, sin is always around the corner. This is why we have to make sure we're tuned in with God's ways and desires for us. And it can be tricky. It can be tricky. There are a million of examples of what it might look like when you and I take things to God. Perhaps I'm asked by someone who works in the corporation with me when I was in the corporate world to allow them to borrow an expensive piece of equipment and swears later to me, this person, that they'll bring it back. Now, it's against company policy because it's too expensive to be replaced by any person, and it might get lost or broken. And although you personally believe that the person will bring it back, your gut is in knots. And I've been there, some similar kind of thing. You can, you can see a different scenario in your own mind. Well, practically speaking, I know I should talk with God. Ask God's help and advice. Listen for God. Think about scripture and how it might help me to know what to do in the situation. But if I don't have a relationship with God and I haven't worked through these tricky things before, the temptation is there and I could be lost if I just go on my own. If I attempt to take the matter on without God, it may turn out okay. It can be okay. We can think through things ourselves. God's given us that ability but there's less of a chance of a misstep if I'm walking with God. Good, too, is to go to the Bible and see if Scripture leads me to know what to do. I may need to confront the person who just wanted to borrow that item. The holiness tradition would have me surrender the situation to God, then make my own heart sure, but at pure, as long as it was pure and merciful, to look into the temptations. Not only that that person's giving me, but that I might give myself to look the other way, right? It's not a wrong or right that I wanna give you for this little scenario or the one that you just thought of in your head that's key. The key is the act of going to God and talking it out and looking at each piece of scripture as we might otherwise blindly just grasp onto an idea. Not only will these steps help me or you to do the right thing and hopefully keep from sinning, 
But by seeing that God has led me the best each time, guess what happens to your relationship with God? It grows more. (laughs) It just happens that way. Much like when you have a friend. You start out with that friend and you have something in common and you start talking. And as time goes on, what happens? The friendship gets stronger because you have more respect for that person. You have more love with that person. You've communicated and know what they're thinking more. Can you see that with God too? The truth is, we can have a list of do's and don'ts, but it will often fail us. There's no list, no religion interpreted and made by humankind that can cover everything and give us the perfect answer in all scenarios. No theology is perfect, no words of today can be perfect for tomorrow in all time periods or all situations. Moreover, we will fail to see what God really wants us to be like and how God wishes us to live if we just ritualistically list things like not going into the field on the Sabbath. (laughs) Lists may say that something's good and must always be done a certain way, but they also mean that you could just kind of memorize it, right? (laughs) If I just go through and I know that I'm supposed to do A, B, C every time and that to me and my belief is all I need for God to be happy with me, I don't really need to have a, a reasoning ability. I don't have to have my experiences to use. I kind of could have been just an animal and God could have stopped with the animals right there on the, I think the fifth day, right? <laughs> but God didn't stop there. And God did not make us robots. We don't have artificial intelligence, we have our own intelligence. And we have been given free will, which means God expects us to use the brain we have. Amen? I don't know about you, but when I think of a relationship with God, it's a loving and kind one. Yes, I make God mad. And because of it, I have in my relationship with God, I know it usually. (laughs) And you know what? I have to pay the price, either to society or God or myself my family, as needed. But I can mend my ways. I can ask for forgiveness and know that God will give it. And that means I can still go on with a loving relationship with my best friend. And it's not fear that God wants. It's respect. It's not a fear of being cast out into hell or damnation, or whatever you want to talk about. God wants you to have what my father would call a healthy fear. (laughs) My dad said when we were little, and I said, you're making me afraid of you. And I I thought that was going to get him. He said, well, I want you to have a healthy fear of me. It's a little fear that's trepidation that I'm not doing the right thing because I'm your guidance, and that's what God is. But as you grow as a person, it's really not fear, it's respect that he wanted me to grow into. It's no different with God. Contemplation, learning what is holy, making sure that we act such that God is with us in our actions, leading us all the way, that brings stability and security of a deeper relationship with our Lord and a peace that's beyond understanding. It's what God wants with each one of us, I'm sure. And that is what I pray that you and I have, if not in this moment, in this day, in the coming days, as we try to have a closer relationship with God. Amen. Shall we pray? Lord, lead us, lead us, lead us. Let us sing out and sing your name out. Let us be thankful and glorify your name. But let us walk hand in hand with you as you teach us, advise us, and grow closer with us. All this we pray in Christ's name. Amen.